Hi, I'm Joelle Cook, an Associate Director at FSG and co-author of the Learning Brief Evaluating Complexity. During our recent webinar, What Makes Evaluating Complexity Different, audience members submitted dozens of great questions to our panelists, and since we only had time for a few questions during that hour, we promised to continue the conversation. So today, we have FSG's Hallie Preskill and Shriek Gopal, leading authors on the Evaluating Complexity Brief who will be answering questions that came up during the webinar around using a complexity lens, scaling evaluation, and specific methods for evaluating complex initiatives. So I'll just jump first question. Thank you, Hallie, for joining. So you mentioned that it's useful to take a complexity lens. Uh, what does that mean? Are you advocating for a new approach to evaluation? Yeah, I'll, I can jump in there, uh, Joel. This is Shrek, and uh, it's interesting. You know, we we are not uh, advocating a new approach to evaluation. What we are advocating is uh, a recognition of the fact that most of the time the initiatives that we are evaluating are complex or live in complex environments. And when you're evaluating complex initiatives, you have to adopt a certain lens that is cognizant of that complexity. You have to recognize, for example, that context really matters. It can make or break an initiative. You have to recognize that uh, there are lots of interconnections. There are a lot of moving parts and pieces. You have to you know, understand the fact that their uh, cause and effect relationships aren't linear, predictable, or straightforward. So when you, when you really recognize those properties or those characteristics of of complex systems and you design and implement evaluations accordingly, that's really what we mean by adopting a complexity lens. And it doesn't have to be another, I know there was another question on the webinar about does is it just development of the evaluation? It doesn't have to be just development of the evaluation. I think when you're doing formative or summative evaluations, you can uh, certainly adopt the same lens and you know be cognizant of these characteristics as well. Thanks, Rick. This is Hallie. I'd love to jump in here and just add some additional thoughts here. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's uh, not a different approach per se, as, as Shri says, it's a lens, but it's also an orientation. It's where you shift your gaze and what you look at and what you, what you focus on. And, you know, it's one of those things where you take a sharp focus of what's in front of you, but you also use your peripheral vision and um, look us have a wider gaze um, into what the system is and looking for connections and relationships and that context that Shriek um, talks about. So it's really trying to, first of all, say you want to understand what's happening in the system, what it looks like, and how the intervention or initiative sits within that larger system. So you can actually see how that initiative is being affected by different parts of the system and how when you change one part, of the system through an initiative, it actually creates other kinds of changes that ripple out into the other parts of the system. So it's not like a whole scale new approach to evaluation, but it's an orientation and a, a lens that, that affects the way you see things and what you look for. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, and I would just add that, yeah, I mean, the lens would, uh, I mean, if people want to think about you know, what would be concretely different, the way you design the evaluation would be different, your methods that you use during the evaluation would be different, the way you uh, analyze and synthesize information and feed it back may be different, but it really depends on what, what the initiative needs. But with this different orientation, with different philosophy, you are doing some different things as an evaluator than you would otherwise have. Great, and that's something, I think that leads us to our next question about scale. So I'm hoping um, you could both talk a little bit more about complexity and scale. You know, what does it mean when we take a complexity lens um, and when we're faced with evaluating something that funders perhaps want to take to scale? Mm -hmm. Well, I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Uh, it's kind of an interesting question. Everybody wants to know about scale and our scaling initiatives that work or best practices. And I think, um, I'm not sure it's actually um, different when you take a complexity lens versus a more traditional approach to evaluation. I think it's, um, but it really is about a, an understanding that we, because context matters so much, we really can't take a program and cut and paste it into another locale, another community, another type of organization. 
that really uh, the work around complexity suggests that you really think, need to think about best, uh, excuse me, effect, uh, effective principles of practice. What are the principles around the work that seem to make a difference and that are important? Sometimes they're called simple rules or minimum specifications, but they're guidelines that um, or um, concepts that you want to make sure are implemented and present in other um, in the work wherever it is happening. And so bringing a complexity lens to the work and especially with evaluation means you're looking to see how those principles of practice are implemented in different sites where this initiative is being rolled out. Um, because it's not about trying to have fidelity to a particular model with, because if you, if you believe in complexity then you know there can't be fidelity in every location where a program or initiative is sitting because the context is going to help shape what happens in that particular community, for example. Um, so principles of practice are the way to think about scaling programs or how to look at the scale of programs um, that might be working. Okay. Yeah, I would uh, completely agree with that. I think uh, traditionally um, definition of scale has meant uh, more like uh, replication or, or duplication of the same program in, in multiple uh, sites or multiple locations. And I think we are really starting to think about it more in the principle-based way that Ali mentioned is what are the minimum critical specifications that need to be present in different locations as long as those uh, are also adapting to context. So it's really a both end. Okay. Let's this mean uh, that we do things differently uh, and what methods it, work best when you're taking a complexity lens? Well, I'll jump in there. Um, so the idea is if you if you believe in and you want to bring this complexity lens to the work, then it, it suggests that you need to use <coughs> excuse me, methods that can capture and understand relationships, that can look for connections in the system where they're occurring, that can look for movement and energy in the system. So some of our traditional methods while we still would use them, such as interviews and focus groups and surveys, are probably not sufficient to really understand the shape of that system, the movement of the initiative within the system, the reactions of, of people and organizations within the system, how those re uh, relationships are changing over time, um, the effects that they're having within the system. And so we're, we're suggesting that we expand our repertoire of tools and methods to include things such as appreciative inquiry, um, and systems mapping and theories of change and um, dialogic sessions and uh, network analysis and, and some others I'm sure Shri would, would mention as, as well. So we just want to expand our toolbox um, and, and build on things we already are using. Yeah, the, and those are uh, those are the right tools as Hallie said and, and we're not throwing out the, the baby with the bathwater here in terms of the our interviews and surveys and, and focus groups. We still like those. But there are uh, more innovative tools that give us a richer narrative, give us a more sort of complete picture of the initiative than our traditional methods have done. And you know, those might be mapping tools, uh, systems mapping, outcomes mapping, timeline mapping, whatever those are. Those may be uh, story-based tools, things like appreciative inquiry, uh, reflective practice, where it's built on authentic experiences that ask people to tell stories, to tell narratives. Uh, those may be conversational or dialogic tools, you know, tools like World Cafe and Open Space that really bring groups of people together to have these dynamic nonlinear conversations. Uh, those may be experiential tools, tools that allow uh, the evaluator and potentially others to really experience uh, the lives of beneficiaries, to experience the context. Uh, to experience the initiative in a way that you wouldn't be able to through our traditional tools. So uh, we do provide uh, a table in the brief and a list of tools, but really the, the, what is common to all of them is that they give you a deeper and a richer narrative. Okay. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Hallie and Shriek, for a great discussion and follow-up on some of those questions that came up on the webinar. And thank you to everyone who submitted questions. Uh, next week, we'll be joined by um, Chris Cutsley from Grand Rapids to answer. Didn't have a chance to, to talk through then, so I hope you'll join us. Thank you. Thank you, Joanne.